Let's dive into the nitty-gritty of cellular respiration then. This is part three, and we're dealing with the first part of cellular respiration, and that is glycolysis. As I told you before, we're going to take the six carbon glucose and we're breaking it down into pyruvic acid. And I mentioned to you that the six carbon is sim simply going to be broken down into two three carbon molecules. So that's what we're going to do. So two, two times the three carbon molecule, that's what we're going to make. In order to do this, we're starting with an enzyme. And you'll see the reason why in chapter 5 we talked about enzymes. Because every step of the way, there are enzymes involved in making energy. In this case, the enzyme is called dehydrogenase. And just by its name, you can tell what it does. It pulls hydrogens off of something. And in this case, it's going to pull hydrogens off the glucose. As it does so, the glucose literally falls apart. Because if you're taking electrons away from something, that means the, the covalent bonds are no longer there. This destabilizes the molecule. And once you destabilize it, in a cascade reaction, things just sort of fall apart and rearrange themselves. And this is what happens here. The glucose falls apart and two molecules of pyruvic acid are the result. The high-energy electrons and the hydrogen move to this electron acceptor, this electron carrier device, the NADH. The NADH receives these electrons, so it is being reduced. And I want to make sure I carry that forward so you can see that we are working with a redox reaction here. So you have the glucose getting oxidized, and the NAD plus is being reduced. This NADH then, that's the form it takes, is going to be able to carry the electrons to the electron transport chain, and we'll deal with that one later. One thing that is also important here, since we're working with an enzyme, it actually takes a little bit of energy to get this process started. There is an energy investment phase, and what we're doing here is we're taking two ATP to start the process, and these two ATP, these are ultimately what helps us overcome our inertia. So what it does is it helps us overcome our energy of activation. Remember that? Energy of activation, that was the key thing that we needed to get our car started. And it is the thing we need here to get this process started. Without this initial energy input, the glucose will just sit there. Now that's a good thing, because if we don't need to use the glucose, it's not going to get broken down. That's okay. And then when we do need it, we can invest the energy and we can break it down. Now when, we, when you look at this in a schematic, this is what it looks like. And there are really two parts to this, and you can see this down here. The one, the part on the left, that's the energy investment phase, and this is where we're going for this energy of activation. That's what this is. And once we have this energy of activation invested, we end up with two pathways. Two pathways because we're now working with smaller molecules. We're cutting this here, and so now on the top we have one of those, and on the bottom we have the other one. So as you're looking at these processes, we're going to work with this pyruvic acid, but we're going to look at only one of these areas. That's primarily what we're going to look at. Now, as you see here, this energy investment phase gives us a little bit of phosphate on the top of one of these. So that's energized. That still has an energy coin on the top. So that means if that bond breaks, a little bit of energy becomes available. But first what we'll do is we'll collect the electrons. The electrons are going to be placed into the NAD+. And because these electrons are moving, even here, even right at the very beginning, because of the movement of electrons, because of the kinetic energy, you can attach another little phosphate group to the other end of this molecule. So now you have a molecule 
that is energized at both ends. It has a little energy coin at both of its ends. Well, that is what we can then use, this bond energy here and that bond energy there. That's what we can use to make two ATP. And the same thing goes at the bottom. So that's why we have an investment of two ATP and we have an output of four ATP. Now, if you think about it, that's a pretty good idea. If I give you a dollar and you say, thank you very much, here's two dollars. Well, I would walk around the entire class and collect my dollars, right? Because that's a really good investment. And this is the kind of thing that can happen here. Just by starting to move electrons around, surprising things can happen. We've seen this before. Whenever we talk about biochemistry, you'll realize that sometimes more comes out of it than you actually expect. Recall the example of sodium, the metal, chlorine, the gas. You put them together, you have sodium chloride, a salt. It's one of those weird things. How did that happen? There's no metal left, there's no gas left, it's just salt. And so it is here. When you're moving the electrons around, surprising things can happen. And investing two and immediately getting back four is one of those surprising things. Now the reason why this works is because we have the activity of another enzyme. The process by which we can assemble ATP molecules is called phosphorylation. And phosphorylation in the broadest sense simply means we are adding a phosphate group. So phosphorylation means adding a phosphate group. That's what that means. And substrate level means using an enzyme. So this long term substrate level phosphorylation simply means we're going to add a phosphate group using an enzyme. What are we going to add a phosphate, phosphate group to? We're going to add a phosphate group to ADP. ADP is one of those things that is floating around in our cells all the time because there are all kinds of energy reactions going on. So energy is being used, and that energy use leaves us with ADP. This is one process by which we can recharge the ADP. And I've just moved this to go back. Okay. And so in this case, what we can do is we can take in the phosphate group on one end of this and the ADP, and these two together form the substrate. So therefore, we call it substrate level. So those two together are the substrate. They fit into the active site of this enzyme. And what the enzyme actually does is create this bond. So once that bond is formed, of course, this is no longer a phosphate group. This is no longer an ADP. It's now ATP, and the enzyme releases both just as we had with the sucrase splitting up the sucrose and when it does so you're left with two products which are no longer the sucrose now this here is left over so what you can now do is you can flip this upside down and do it over again so in very rapid succession you can produce two ATP using substrate level phosphorylation and that's the third part that's glycolysis.